So good morning everyone, thanks so much for coming to our breakfast briefing this morning. This is the first event of our new academic year, as you know universities are very fond of our academic years from mm -hmm. September to July. Um, I wish you could say I've had the summer off, that's not true. Um, but we're here ready to go to do a series of breakfast briefings that are all about opening up the university and encouraging our great business community to come and find out about our research and the work of our partners. And we're lucky that we've been sponsored today by Bruton Knowles, so thanks ever so much for helping us to run these sort of events. I'll just hand over to Nick briefly just to say a bit about Bruton Knowles. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, on behalf of Bruton Knowles, I'd like to welcome you to this morning's breakfast briefing. It's fantastic to see so many of you here again today. As property consultants, we are delighted to continue our partnership with the business <coughs> through our sponsorship of property themed events such as this. Uh, so the ongoing development of superfast broadband, I think, is going to be a key driver uh, in shaping the Welsh economy and also the Welsh property market in the next few years. So this morning's seminar promises a fascinating insight into the progress being made and also some of the opportunities and threats presented by this new technology. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Nick. And um, yes, yeah, so we'd be delighted to have Professor Max Monday talking. Um, Giles Phelps, who is here. Yes, Giles. <laughs> was it 8.22? That was the time that we were promised. So, um, Giles Phelps made it 8.22 and David Elms made to talk about this very important topic. I'm the Director of Executive Education, um, Sarah Lethbridge. If you've got any short course needs, if you're interested in our Exec MBA, our part-time HRM programme, our Masters of Public Leadership, please do come and talk to us because this area of business engagement is really important for a successful university like ours. Um, in terms of the next event, we've got an interesting evening event actually, um, hosted by Ecotricity, talking about clean energy to the world's greatest football team. That's an intriguing title if ever I heard one, so please join us for that. Um, the next breakfast briefing is going to be delivered by Simon Dean, the Deputy Chief Executive of um, the NHS in Wales, talking about a healthier Wales document, so Welsh Government's plan to change the NHS in Wales. And that's also linked to a new exciting Exec Ed programme that we've developed, which is around developing a diploma in healthcare planning for the NHS in Wales. So the good thing about that is it's an interdisciplinary approach and we're working with colleagues in the School of Maths, School of Medicine, to deliver what is a unique qualification for um, Welsh healthcare. Um, then we've got another breakfast briefing planned with Bruton Knoll, thanks Bruton Knoll, um, which is all around what attracts businesses to invest in a region, so we're sh still shaping that event um, at the moment. Just a little heads up that our um, breakfast briefing is being live streamed and recorded, um, we won't be featuring, but just so that you're aware. And um, when there's questions and answers at the end, if you could wait for a microphone just so that the audience can hear you, that would be fantastic. So now I'm going to hand over to Max, and he's going to start us off this morning. Thank you, Max. Thanks a lot. Right, so let me get my ducks in a row here. <laughs> yeah, I've got to be. Um, we're going to try and ke uh, keep to time as much as possible. We had three speakers uh, this morning, myself, Giles and David. So we're going to talk for about 15 minutes each to allow a little bit of time, uh, a, little bit of time for, uh, a little bit of time for questions. Now, what have we got here? Yes, OK. So um, what we're going to deal with uh, today is a little bit about you know, how SMEs in Wales in particular can gain benefits and edge from uh, access and adoption of super fast broadband and, new, and the new opportunities the infrastructure presents. So we've got th really three elements that we're trying to, we're trying to cover off, uh, which we're going to try and cover off today. So you know, we've, got the, we've got an academic, Giles involved in the industry, and we've got David who's very much tied into the policy side. So you've got academic industry and policy maker here. So there's three aspects we're going to try and cover off between us. I'm going to cover off the first uh, nasty looking bubble there. How far is there evidence uh, of SME digital adoption in Wales and productivity gains from successful adopters? Then there's, going to, you know, there's a blob here talking about infrastructure challenges uh, facing Wales around digital rollout. And then lastly, the last bubble here, how can, Wales, uh, sorry, how can SMEs benefit from advice, uh, advice etc. that's available from, uh, from regional um, from regional government. Um, 
a little bit of context, I think, is always helpful. Uh, is always uh, helpful to start. Um, you know, wh why are we interested? You know, why do we think that there is a problem here? Um, we think, um, as economists, we don't know, but we think that there is, you know, there are innovate, innovation and productivity. There, or there is an innovation potential um, in ICT, but there's always this fear that relative to larger businesses um, in an in economy, SMEs, and particularly, as I'm going to show a bit later on in the Prezi, particularly micro, very, very small firms, you know, perhaps employing nobody or just one or two people, might be resistant to adopt or implement um, ICT. There might be poor, much poorer recognition of potential in smaller firms. M you know, much more um, cognizance perhaps of the risks involved in take up in, in smaller firms that they would be greater than the, than the benefits so you know small firms mm -hmm. might be more resistant much, might be much more resistant to change so Welsh Government policy which is the programme that we're seeking to support with our research is trying to encourage ICT adoption um, and with the aim of trying to get these ICT productivity um, increases. Right, why is that relevant? Why is that important? Well, we're concerned, aren't we, in, in the region economy. Um, you know, conven in conventional economic terms, our productivity falls well behind that in many other regions of the UK. So, Anything that we can do to try and improve regional productivity is very important. And yeah, this is why I'm, personally I, you know, I was very interested in this, this program of research because of a potential to improve productivity in our SMEs. And it is a persistent problem and it's not going, it's not going away. I mean, you can't see it, it's, uh, it's a bit fuzzy in the bottom there, but it's showing how productivity in Wales compares to other regions of the UK. So it's not just a problem with the rest of the South East, it's a problem with respect to our, you know, some of the other peripheral regions of the UK here. So how can things like improved digital infrastructure, how can that w lead to improvements in regional productivity? And particularly interesting, interesting for regional economies, it's not just the gap between Wales and other regions in terms of productivity, but can digital infrastructure actually work to close divides in Wales, if you like, very generally between the urban and the regional uh, areas, uh, uh, sorry, the urban and the rural areas, uh, areas of Wales. So a little bit of, um, just a little bit of context, uh, a little bit of context there. <coughs> but as researchers, second bit of context, we know that making the linkages is really quite quite difficult thing to do. I mean, the, the, the very early. I mean, so, some of this goes back to Bob uh, Bob Solow's work. You know, very early on, um, it's quite difficult to actually make linkages between ICT and business productivity. I mean, the early work only found very inconclusive evidence of this, and that as that was likely down to poor, the difficulties of measurement, time lags. You have to wait a long time for the productivity improvements to, um, to occur. The point, I'm, I mean, I'm not going to go through all the bubbles of this slide, but the point I'm trying to make here is it's a complex issue to try to make links between ICT investment, the availability of new infrastructure and business productivity. There's a lot of other things going on in the economy. Um, there's much more interesting contemporary research, well, I'm saying contemporary, last <coughs> 20, uh, 20, uh, 25 years, in the process the process through which businesses adopt. And in our programme of research, that's been something we've been very, very interested in. The process through which firms, uh, firms adopt, um, adopt super, fast, uh, super fast broadband and, and the advantages that it brings. OK, so I need to cut. Um, a bit time delimited here, but I want to try and cut quickly to what Cardiff University uh, is doing um, in support of a super fast <coughs> business, uh, super fast broadband business exploitation project. Just to give you just a quick, uh, I was going to say Cook's tour, that wouldn't be a good one, <laughs> would it? Now, uh, uh, so just a, you know, a quick journey, uh, a quick tui journey around, um, around, uh, around, uh, around what we're doing. So 
We provide um, the research, the research support around the Superfast uh, uh, Business Broadband Exploitation Programme. We assist the adv advisory panel of the, uh, of the project. So we provide, uh, we provide evidence. I guess if I was to try and nail it down into a nutshell, I, I think there are three things we try to do. I'm interested, or we're interested, in how our SMEs are exploiting Superfast, or how they're not exploiting it. You know, are there firms that have access to the infrastructure, but they're not, they're, they're not using it, so we're looking at the positive and the negative. Is it making, is there evidence to show that it's making SMEs more productive? And moreover, what are the whole economy impacts? I know what's, I, or, or I, I may have a little bit of information about what's happening to the SMEs in our sample, but you know, what are the economy-wide effects of, um, uh, of the infrastructure? So, in sum, university, I think it was true, we're trying to develop the evidence base in Wales um, to, to show the significance of you know, what happens when firms adopt, um, adopt super, fast, uh, super fast broadband and the technologies it allows. So our work has four strands. Um, uh, most of what I'm going to say in the next five or six minutes is about our digital maturity survey, our annual uh, digital maturity survey. However, so we, we produce a digital maturity survey once a year. We produce an economic impact report, which, which uh, draws upon the uh, digital maturity survey to look at, um, I guess the digital maturity survey is very much a dashboard. You know, this is where our, we believe our SMEs are at. The economic impact is trying to show, well, you know, you know, you know what's the evidence for performance and productivity improvement. That's a separate report, also produced every year. But we also pr provide uh, other things. We have a um, we have a program of work in horizon scanning, looking at those things that are just over the horizon, technology-wise, that might affect our SMEs in the uh, broadband uh, space. And we also do discrete research, just I individual. Uh, individual reports. As I said, I want to focus very much on uh, the DM, our uh, digital maturity survey, our seeking evidence. This goes out, well, it's out at the moment. It's a little reminder if there's any SMEs uh, reps in the room, so please f f fill it out. It's out there at the moment. We, 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 we send it out at this time, uh, time of year. I'm talking about last year's uh, last year's findings. Next, year, the findings for DMS 2019 will be available uh, in due course. So last year, now, I think we had 453 respondents last year. So it's quite a uh, quite a large number of firms actually uh, actually respond to this, and we're very grateful for those uh, for those returns. So. Um, our DMS, it examines digital technology use in Wales, seeks to understand change through time. It, again, that, that's important for me. I, I, I'm telling you we're trying to develop an evidence base, but it, as far as possible, it's longitudinal. I'm trying to look, or we're trying to look at what actually changes through time. So, you know, you know is, there, is there evidence that more firms are, are, are taking on cloud applications? Is there evidence that more firms are engaged in e-sales than they were in 2016? So those are the sorts of questions the DMS is uh, seeking to answer uh, longitudinally. Okay, so that's what it is. What I'm going to do just in the next, uh, the next few slides, I'm just going to give you, and it, it is, I think there's a, there's a lot of information uh, in it. It's not a long survey, but we're able to derive quite a bit of information uh, from it. Um, first of all, um, we have uh, adoption, uh, adoption of broadband, it's a, the impact of the ICT infrastructure. Um, what, looking, uh, we've got three years there, 2016 to 2018, and what that's showing us uh, here uh, is that super fast adoption, you know, SMEs that have a, you know, access to super, it is growing through time, so that's a, that's a good news story. Um, Obviously, we want that to be higher because there are things you can do with super fast that you cannot do with standard. But that's quite an encouraging uh, headline. But the number of our surveyed firms that are in, uh, that are adopting super fast has consistently increased uh, through time, as you would expect here. Um, 
I mean, it's not shown on the slide. I'm just giving you a few extra bullets here. It does vary by sect. I know, I, you, know you would expect that. So obviously, greater, higher concentration. When we break this down into industry groups, there's more adoption in sectors such as ICT, business, uh, business and other services. Um, one of the other things we see, perhaps a little bit more alarming, um, is we, we also look at, well, you know, firms in urban as opposed to firms in rural areas. And it does seem, you know, our research does suggest that, you know, urban firms uh, you know, have a higher propensity to take up than firms in rural areas. That's a <coughs> bit of a concern, given what we know about productivity differences between urban and rural, uh, urban and rural parts of Wales. Um, use of cloud computing services. Um, again, um, a, steady, uh, a steady increase through time. Um, just a few headlines here. You know, we find in the DMS 18, 2018, that most SMEs just use basic applications. Um, again, some differentiation across, uh, across sectors. Uh, higher use in sectors such as manufacturing and ICT, as you would expect. Um, construction, the lowest use of cloud, uh, cloud, cloud applications. It's quite, uh, again, some variation by sec, uh, um, uh, by sec and by firm size. So medium-sized firms are you know, more likely to use cloud applications than our, than our smallest firms. Um, Share of e-sales in total sales. Well, again, sorry, this is a little bit of a busy slide, but again, it's showing uh, showing increase. I mean, uh, the you know the, the, the number of uh, the proportion of firms that have that are actually using uh, or selling a proportion of their output for e-sales is increasing through time. So the proportion that are not using anything is going down through time. So again, quite a positive. Uh, oh. <laughs> Now, when I'm lecturing, we haven't got these. This is the, the PG Centre's got smart screens. You know, we, 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 we don't have that in the lecture at lecture theatres yet. Um, okay, so again, some sectoral differences here. You know, SMEs in the comms and food service ICT had highest share of sales, e sales, uh, in 2018. Here, rural SMEs more likely than urban to report the majority of their total sales being e sales. And that's probably. Again, there's a sectoral issue there. You know, tour, that's probably reflecting a larger number of tourism businesses in um, in rural uh, rural areas. Um, my time is almost gone. Um, one of the other things we do, um, we try and group our firms into clusters according to how digitally engaged they are. So, you know, we 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 use a great deal of data from the survey to do this so we classify businesses as digitally disengaged you know are they passive exploiters are they more active exploiters of a resource or are they really digitally digitally embedded so we look at this year by year by year i just give you a cut here between 2017 and 2018 and what we find is that on our on our measure um the, the, the proportion of the survey returns where the, you know, the firms would be classified as digitally embedded is actually increasing. So that's, again, that's good news. The, the active exploiters, you know, the next level down, it's actually increasing. The digitally disengaged is, is actually f you know, falling through time. So overall, a good, uh, a good news story. But, yeah, um, it's a good news story, but we... As economists, we love bad news, don't we? So, yeah, you, you, you have to reflect on that. Yes, good things are happening in Wales here, but good things are also happening in other regions of the UK. So when we monitor what's happening in other regions of the UK, you know, SMEs in other parts of the UK are also improving. So it's not a, it's not a, a static, uh, static picture. Okay. So to finish, what about you know what about performance? Well, the DMS uh, 18 um, it's quite positive again. Positive. Uh, okay, I accept. You know, this is a this is a, a self-reporting self-reporting survey. But over half of respondents reported that access to Superfast had a positive outcome on their profits. Um, similar proportion. There'd been a positive impact uh, on innovation and employment. Um, quite surprising. You know, but sometimes we think, don't we, that. You know, digital innovation can have a negative impact on employment. Many of these firms are actually reporting positive uh, impact uh, impact on employment. Um, 
the economic impact report, and I can only touch on this, um, you know, what does it mean? You know, if I was to if I was to draw inference, for example, from the 2018, so if, if well, to put it simply, if I was to gross it up to the, the whole population of Welsh SMEs, what, what, what would it mean? What were the positive results in the survey? What, if, if we could generalise across Wales, what would that translate into? Well, we estimate almost the, the sort of turnover improvements that are reported in the survey, when writ large to the population, would, would equal about £170 million worth of additional turnover. And nearly 40, you know, if our findings can be generalised, nearly 50,000 SMEs with a sustained employment increase. So quite, uh, quite significant, uh, quite significant uh, numbers. Um, I must, I'm, I must hand over to Giles, but you know, just a few conclusions in the, the, the more suitable for today's web of blue bubbles. Um, um, my, my, my key conclusions from our work today, we, I've not been able to go through everything here, but you know, some of the econometric work we're doing has been showing a strong connection between ICT and the availability of the infrastructure <coughs> in terms of upload and download schemes. Um, speed and business productivity so we've got, we've got, got some evidence there um, what are what are our conclusions well you know ICT infrastructure is complementary country specific asset it should be available to all firms requires public investment um, good quality ICT infrastructure is important in allowing firms to capitalize on the opportunities um, resources alone are not enough you know it's how the firms use you know Giving people access to superfast isn't going to be enough. It's how they actually use it. So yeah, you've got the resource, but how do you use it? It's the use that ties through to the uh, to productivity gains. Um, and to, oh, I'm out of time here, but also quite worrying. Micro firms, those smallest firms in the Welsh economy, are the least likely to use digital technologies such as cloud applications, websites, social media. And that is why. You know, the programme of assistance um, that uh, WG and the Welsh Government is partners are running are so, so important because it's, you know, much of that is targeted on these smallest uh, firms. And with that, I'm going to hand over to, seamlessly, to, 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 to Giles. Thank you, Max. So right, I'll, uh, I'll probably be a bit briefer, so uh, hopefully we'll catch up. Um, thank you for that, Max. Um, I, I'm sort of going to talk a bit about um, uh, Wales and, and infrastructure deployment and some of the challenges, um, but it does tie in very much with the, the super fast exploitation work that we're doing, um, and I think some of the traditional perceptions of the challenges we have um, deploying broadband uh, are probably not as straightforward as many people think. So um, one of the things that, that Max was into that uh, is the poor take of a broadband. Um, and we find in Wales it's quite frustrating when we're talking to businesses uh, and SMEs uh, that they tend to not understand the benefits they get from broadband. And this is important for us as we're a company that, that builds broadband infrastructure. What we want to see is people take it up and consume that product. If they don't consume it, then it's not really worth us investing and in deploying <coughs> the infrastructure. So it's really important that we do that. Um, in this country, the penetration of what we call full fibre broadband, which is um, broadband where we've removed all copper infrastructure, um, is actually quite low. Most people think of around seven, eight, nine percent around the UK. Similar sort of percentages in Wales. Um, obviously, it's increasing now that we recognise the benefits it brings. But the interesting thing is, um, take up in the country, even though we haven't got much infrastructure, the take up is incredibly poor. Um, the Fibre to the Home Council uh, March this year published uh, a survey and the UK came bottom uh, with 1.5% take up compared to other countries that were 50% plus um, and that was a, a survey of 33 countries um, mostly around Europe so I think uh, it was quite interesting to see even where we have this fibre infrastructure we're not really using it or exploiting it uh, and this is a real challenge when we're trying to build out 
that infrastructure. We're trying to get a return on our investment. And if no one is going to consume that product, it makes it very difficult for us to invest. There are some traditional challenges, and in Wales we, we, we particularly suffer. So way leaves is a constant one. The permission from a landlord or a landowner to deploy this infrastructure is always fun. Uh, but in Wales, what we find is a lot of the property, a lot of the um, real estate is owned either by big pension companies, but organisations outside of Wales. And when we approach them to say, can we have permission to install fibre in your building to service the number of business tenants um, that is either very slow, non-existent, or they charge a huge amount of money. They have no interest at the moment, it seems, in enabling their buildings or their property to be fibre enabled, um, which is really frustrating for us and even more frustrating for the tenants that are in those buildings. And we get this a, su a surprising number of times. Uh, we, we've had, literally in the last few weeks, landlords that have refused us entry onto their business parks or into their building because they don't really understand. They believe their tenants don't need this product or service. Now that's a, a big problem that we have to deal with. We also have in the more rural parts of Wales, obviously a lot of landowners. Now deploying infrastructure can be quite cost effective if you're, if you're building across farmers land in more rural areas. But when they want tens of thousands of pounds in way leave charges and permissions to build across their land, it negates the benefit of that. So a lot of the rural areas and a lot of rural SMEs suffer because the landowners are either holding the, the broadband suppliers to ransom or they're just not interested in uh, allowing us across their land. So these are challenges and, and, and they should be opportunities for Wales but at the moment they're, they're quite difficult. The other thing we have uh, and pretty much this is universal across the UK but especially in Wales is a lack of skills. Um, there aren't many people that understand how to deploy broadband infrastructure efficiently either on the highways or in buildings and we've lost an awful lot of the skills and talent that we did have most of it is going over to England where they're building furiously um, fibre to the premise and we have lost a lot of talent that has moved over especially into the southwest that where they're now rapidly building out more fibre to the premise there are probably about 20 to 30 active alternative network providers in England at the moment those are providers that aren't basically BT or Virgin, they are smaller providers who are now <coughs> spending hundreds of millions of pounds or even billions on putting this infrastructure in the ground. And they have soaked up every single bit of talent you can pretty much think of. They are desperately looking for more skills. So in Wales we've got a challenge in that we've got to bring people back and we've got to train people up. And it's a huge, huge task to get the number of people we need to actually build this infrastructure. So I think that's one of, the, one of the things. It also has a knock-on effect, and it's a bit of a catch-22 situation. A lack of competition in Wales also means prices are, are higher. If we take, uh, for instance, um, Southampton, uh, where there's an organisation on Altnet called Tube uh, that have just started up and started deploying infrastructure, um, there are al already two other Altnets um, that, are, uh, that are in Southampton, High Proptic and City Fibre. And then you've got, traditionally, BT and Virgin. Now, Tube are offering a one gigabit broadband connection for £25 a month. Uh, in comparison, if you were in Merthyr Tidville, for instance, BT is your only choice at the moment. Uh, they do do some, a small amount of fibre to the premise, but it would cost you over £200 a month to get a similar service to <coughs> that that Tube is offering. So, into, if we're to address digital deprivation, we must bring competition into Wales. Otherwise, prices will remain high. <coughs> so these are all challenges and altnets will not come to Wales unless there is good take up and good demand for the product so it can be consumed so it is a bit of a catch-22 um, I was recently reading, reading the, uh, the Cardiff Capital Region report and they, they, they put a quote in there saying connectivity is crucial both physical and digital we need a reliable infrastructure to boost productivity and prosperity and there's lots of words in, in documents, and we see this across um, a lot of the political spectrum, everybody recognises that infrastructure is important. And there's a lot of talk about how we're going to pay for the infrastructure, but there's very little support for saying, how are we going to stimulate demand? How are we going to pay for not only awareness, um, certainly in businesses, of how they can use this infrastructure, but how we can help them pay to use some of the services that, that make that infrastructure important? 
and I think from our point of view this is a, a crucially overlooked part of the, the sort of the political spectrum everybody's talking about how we fund building infrastructure not how do we help stimulate demand how do we improve productivity and that kind of thing because the infrastructure will come um, some of the opportunities one of the reasons I like working in Wales and I think there's a, a huge opportunity it's a devolved nation. Now that gives us some really good advantages over probably the rest of the UK in terms of an opportunity. Um, obviously road, rail, devolved, or rail will be I believe soon, um, but things like planning, all of these opportunities, these are stumbling blocks for a lot of infrastructure providers. Um, we need access to land, we need access to buildings, we need planning permission to be a little bit more relaxed than it possibly is. Wales has that opportunity. We have things like fibre tax. That's a big controversial one. Uh, if anybody's Welsh government in here, I'm going to uh, debate with them uh, endlessly about fibre tax. Is a tax on putting fibre in the ground. As soon as we light that fibre and use that fibre, technically we're taxed on it. Um, if you're trying to stimulate demand and you're trying to roll out infrastructure, our argument is the companies or the ISPs are already being taxed. Why tax them again um, on that infrastructure? And if you're trying to stimulate deployment, um, uh, the UK government um, came up with a five-year moratorium on fibre tax at the moment, so there is a five-year um, holiday period where we're not paying it to obviously again stimulate it. In Scotland, they've actually increased that to 10 years um, to again um, help stimulate demand. Uh, I am still lobbying the Welsh government to say, can we increase it please? Um, but it's that kind of thing that, that, that would massively help. Um, as I mentioned before, Education is very important. We've also got a security issue. We also spend an awful lot of time with our SMEs uh, and residential customers, educating them about security. There is still an awful lot of fear about the horrible, bad internet. Um, I'll connect this in and I'm losing millions of pounds in my bank account. And there is, unfortunately, a lot of cyber crime going on, but there are also a lot of solutions to help protect. And again, part of the education process is saying to people, look, there are some very, you know, you can get these very good internet connections and you can get the security that goes along with it and most of it's free. It doesn't cost you a penny, but it all revolves around education. So we have to handhold some of the SMEs sometimes to say, look, this is how you can benefit from the internet and this is how you can protect yourself and get around a lot of that thing, those sort of problems. Uh, we're getting asked an awful lot about 5G and what 5G will do for uh, rural as well as urban environments. 5G is very, very different, and, and the way people talk about 5G is quite interesting, um, uh, and, and in some ways I think it's going to save the world, according to, to, to some bloggers. Um, it is a different technology, it is incredibly useful, um, there are some significant benefits to it, um, but the one thing is it requires a lot of fibre. You cannot deploy 5G in a major way without having a core fibre infrastructure. So. Although we might think that we're moving very much to a wireless world, we still need that wired infrastructure, if not more so than, than before. <coughs> Again, going back to the opportunities, it's a very new technology, and there are huge opportunities. We're talking about autonomous vehicles, smart roads, and this kind of thing, and again, 5G will play a big part of that, and certainly wireless world, but we need that fiber infrastructure. The great thing is, technology is moving so fast, it's not like we're hugely behind the curve in Wales. We have an opportunity, it's quite easy to get ahead of that curve, because the technology moves on. Somebody who's deployed wireless infrastructure three years ago is already now sitting on very much outdated infrastructure. We've now got um, Wi-Fi version 6, or whatever you want to call it, but that's coming out as well, enhanced with 5G. These are step changes in technology. If we want to adopt these now, we can massively get ahead of the game. So part of it again is education and just explaining to people what we can do with this technology and understanding with 5G we need that core fibre infrastructure. This is all about education, this is all about awareness of what it can do. Um, one of the biggest hurdles people talk about in terms of broadband um, infrastructure and anybody that's in a not spot or a slow spot will be sat there going when am I going to get super fast, ultra fast or whatever high speed broadband. A lot of people think it's about the money and I have to say we've attracted very little or no private investment into Wales. In England they've had billions of pounds of private investment. There are 
huge organisations waiting to invest in infrastructure. So there is a huge amount of private investment that will happily come into Wales and build that infrastructure. And it is in the billions and they're very, very interested. And there's lots of companies overseas now that are starting to invest in this infrastructure. They see it as core and they see it as critical. The biggest issue we have is whenever we go to London, they'll say, why build in Wales? Why should we invest? Why should we build infrastructure and invest in infrastructure in Wales? And because of that poor take up and because of that, uh, the issues with the, with the technology and, and the businesses not consuming that technology and the appreciation of flexible working and working from home and how this reliable technology can work, because that's not there, then it's perceived that Wales isn't really interested in this technology. Therefore, it's probably going to be last on the list. So for me, it's really important that we take Wales and say, this is what this technology can do. This is how we use it. Consume it. Make sure you've got reliable services. Make sure you've got fast services. But the quality is just as important, if not more important, than speed. So we have to educate um, the users in Wales to say, this is what this technology can do, and get them to consume the product. And that way we will attract more investment and more infrastructure into the area. I think one of the things that we, uh, one of the last things I want to talk about is R&D. We don't really have the infrastructure at the moment for the research and development. So a lot of the technological innovations that are coming out around digital are probably not going to happen in Wales because there are no experimental services. There are no, there is very little dark fibre and R and D networks around that, that people can play with. We have an issue with trying to find um, networking staff, for instance, that are skilled in understanding how an internet service provider works because most internet service providers are either based in London or North around sort of Manchester Leeds area, and I think. For us, again, that lack of skills and a lack of the ability to play with the technology and understand how it works um, is absolutely critical to us. So we need to bring that into, into the area. We have an internet exchange in Cardiff now that we're <coughs> desperately trying to build. Uh, the number of people in the area that understand how an internet exchange works and what benefits can bring is very limited. So we're busy trying to educate a lot of the networking engineers in the area to say this is how an internet exchange works. It's very different from your normal corporate enterprise networking but this is something that is absolutely going to be core to, to future networking. So with that R&D opportunities we, we've worked with um, Bristol is Open and, uh, and our colleagues across the, across the water and we've seen some incredibly <coughs> good companies sort of rise up out of that and you've got companies like Blue Wireless and Zeta Networks that are quite innovative in what they do, but they've got great opportunities there to deploy their, their technology in Bristol and lots of R&D networks. So for, for us, we want to see a lot of that research and development um, opportunities linked with academia to try and develop some of the IP. If we want to look at things like how we address social care, technology is going to be one of the keys for that. So we want to develop the IP around that social care um, and preferably start selling it to, to, to other um, other regions and other countries potentially. So for us that infrastructure and that investment has to be there but we need it's all about education and telling people what they can do with this technology and making sure that they can get the best out of it and promote it and then most of the altnets will come and build that infrastructure then off the back of that and say right we can get a return on our investment. So that, that's really me for now so I'm going to hand over <coughs> to David probably. Well, thank you. Yes. <coughs> Morning. A lot of familiar faces in the room. My name is David Ellsmere. I'm the partnership manager for Superfast Business Wales. Uh, we're the So What project, and Giles and the others have finished putting that additional infrastructure in the ground. We're there to help businesses do things differently, understand what they can and can't do in that digital arena. Um, we run, at the moment, between about 50 and 70 workshops a quarter, Pan Wales, uh, <coughs> small tech to businesses in the room, and we're helping them understand what they can do in that digital space. We're a knowledge exchange programme, if you like. As part of that, 
They also get access to a one-to-one -one support with a business advisor. <coughs> and that's where we really hone in on what that business wants to do. They get quite a comprehensive digital report, which gives some um, immediate actions, usually things around Google My Business and stuff like that. And probably you might not want to be operating Windows 7 anymore. <laughs> How many? We still see. Um, um, but it's also a longer term. They've got support on their digital bookshelf as they grow the business where they can go for more information about what they can do. Um, we also give them a free website. What I wanted to concentrate really today is on some of the case studies and why businesses should be thinking about what they can do in the digital arena, the digital space. Obviously, reducing costs. A lot of the case studies I'm going to show you in a minute uh, costs both in cash terms, but also in time. One of the things we get back from a lot of the businesses we see is, I now have time to think about my business instead of just doing the business, because I've automated the whole of the back office. Hopefully growing profits, and we do see a lot of that. And increasingly improve stability. You can run your business from anywhere now. The type of things we talk about in the workshops, and I'll quickly run through these to get onto the case studies, but obviously about how you can software as a service. Microsoft Office, I'll show you a slide in a minute. Um, increasingly now we're talking to organisations about uh, cloud phones voice over internet protocol. So how that can save time and money. And for a small business, how you can, because we're still obsessed with landlines and landlines in this country, but how you can still seem to be a big business. My phone is my desk phone, my mobile phone. So wherever I am, somebody rings my desk phone, that will ring. <laughs> um, we, we talk about the, the, the various free services available, we also talk about the paid for services, about how you can use all of these things to run your business efficiently from wherever you want to be. Uh, and obviously there's tax, so your, your, your finances there, online accountancy processes. And we do talk about uh, client relationship management systems, I think picking up on one of jobs is quite about education. A lot of what we're starting to see in businesses is they don't understand what data they've got in their business and how they can manipulate that data. We'll talk about that in a minute too. This is our periodic table of Office 365. <laughs> and as Charles has over all the people, a lot of people have Office 365, but they're only really using it for them, email and things like that. And Microsoft are dreadful about telling people about what you can actually do with it. I like it because if you're a small business, you can act like a big business, you can look really professional, you can do electronic invoicing, you can do brilliant reports, brilliant online reports, all for £10 per user per month. If you want to pay a little bit extra, you get access to things like Power BI, where you can start to manipulate the data, sh show what data you've got in the business and how you can measure the impact of what you're doing constantly. With OneDrive, you can access your documents from wherever you are, wherever you want to be and it's very secure. I was with, um, I usually follow around the um, cyber security guys that uh, <coughs> the organised crime unit. And I usually have to do my talk afterwards when they frighten the life out of them. <laughs> and, they can be there. and we did one in Pembrokeshire the other week. Um, and there was a guy in the room who had been um, fished for £31,000. Literally the week before. Um, so I went up to him afterwards and sort of said, you know, where are you taking this now? How are you doing this? You're going to tell me to go to the cloud, aren't you? I'm not going to the cloud. <laughs> <laughs> and it is how do we educate the small businesses to understand the security, the access, the ability to run your business using it, just by saying, I'm not going to go to the cloud, it's not safe. And it was, his vision was nothing to do with the cloud. His vision was for security, and he told everybody he was going on holiday through social media. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it's behavioural rather than the systems that are causing some of the issues. We talk a lot about social media, by far our most popular workshops. Um, partly I think because people think they can do a lot of this themselves and for free, and yes you can. But I hope one of the takeaways from our programme is that actually you need to invest in this, you can do it properly, you might want to go and pay somebody to do this, unless you've got a full time dedicated marketing person. I don't usually get too excited about social media marketing, but I was putting together a presentation for a different audience, um, and it's a holiday letting company in North Wales. They've got five or six properties up in North Wales, 
they are using targeted fancy advertising. <coughs> they are running with about 80% occupancy and they're spending the whole amount of one pound fifty a week in Facebook advertising. <coughs> yeah. <coughs> Amazing, isn't it? It just shows you the targeted marketing you can do now using these facilities. Top right YouTube is the second biggest search engine in the world. Forget this. Anybody under the age of about 30 never Googles anything on YouTube. <laughs> Somebody somewhere has done a video for it. Mm -hmm. And in terms of your business and how you're marketing to people, how you're doing your brand, you might want to be thinking about that sort of thing. People don't read words anymore, they like watching videos. Digital marketing, we've talked pretty much about. What I really wanted to show you is some of the impact that the businesses we've worked with have had <coughs> from taking up technology. <coughs> Some good figures there. Remote working saved us three and a half grand. Good old fit my floor. In there, give away a floor every month on, on Facebook. Target, we'll talk about in a second. Nordic International is an interesting one. They do translation services, mainly for Scandinavian countries. And they do most of it now through um, FaceTime and things like that, Skype. So again, increase their business but reduce their costs. Some of the case studies, this is Tarvin Precision, one of our older ones. I want to pick up uh, a, a bit about uh, the Windows 10 and the um, uh, security element, cyber security element of it. But also, more interestingly, about their CRM system. They have a, a, a specialist system installed. Again, it's about they can track and monitor each of the orders that are going through in real time. And the in-house marketing team is using that data to target where they are going for business. Facebook Carpentry. Up at the main Cardiff conference last year. Um, electronic system replacing 15 different spreadsheets. The organisation that I work for, we still have 15 different spreadsheets. <laughs> <laughs> we are starting to use a nice piece of kit we put at Microsoft Office called Flow, so we only input the stuff once and it goes into those 15 different spreadsheets, but hey, we still have on 50 different spreadsheets. They like it, they, they're, they're a carpentry business, they do, um, a lot of their guys are out on site. Now those guys can track the process of the orders on site. I don't <coughs> have to do um, again, I was reading yesterday, um, a security firm who does security for construction sites, they've um, just given all their guys um, access to Office 365, they've got, obviously got uh, cameras on their phones, so they, when they're walking around inspecting a site, they're taking pictures of the site, videos of the site, what they're doing, which is being back to head office. So the quote is with the site before they've left the site. So just thinking a bit differently about how they can how they can use the technology and what they can do to, to get that competitive edge. Terrace Patisserie. They want to be quite small for bakers to uh, um, supply an industrial scale. Uh, they use uh, enterprise resource software, um, which has helped them gain their accreditation they need for, for their food production. But the bit I like is that their machine won't make the cakes unless <laughs> unless anybody uh, unless all the materials are in place. So it's saving waste. They press the button, and this all the materials there it won't it won't go. Apollo Wales cleaning company. Um, they started from staff retention issues. We're looking at how they could keep their staff engaged. And one of their surveys said that there was um, uh, their industrial cleaning predominantly was about um, security. So they gave each of their staff mobile phones with GPS and a tank button effectively. They then sort of worked out what else can we do with this now. So all of their workflows are done through uh, an app. So the staff pick their work, it's not anything. They need the works up there, they pick it. More importantly, if they can't do it, somebody who's due to be here tomorrow morning, it was Johnny Six, so they can't come in. They release that job and it pings around everybody else in the system. <coughs> Culturally, it's quite interesting about Tampa, 
that's impacted their staff because they feel much more empowered. They're not being told what to do. They're choosing how their work works. Cold test, 2,000 hours efficiency savings in a year. Reduced cost using VoIP system. Their project report is reduced down to 24 hours, and again, a lot of their staff don't even come back into the office. They're out and about. Automating system saving of two hours a week, <coughs> and I like the bottom one. The investment we've made in digital is really safe for itself. And the last one, you <coughs> try the Robins. They're using Google Information Modeling about how you can 3 and 4D look at plans. Projects more fix efficiency, and again, they're using QuickBooks uh, as an accountancy package, but also, again, they're using it to analyse which dogs are profitable and how long it takes. So it's a very, very quick run through some of the impact that digital technology is having on this business and how our programmes help them usually do the strategy bit. A lot of our advisors go and ask those stupid questions. What are you actually trying to achieve? What do you want to do? And then we can find the resource to help you do it. Um, all of this technology is an enabler, not an end in itself. And I think just picking up on your point, a lot of it is about education and business system. What can you do? How can you do it? And the other message is most of this is relatively low cost because it's revenue costs now rather than capital costs to do a lot of this stuff. So why would you not pay? Thank you. Charles, I think it was, it was regarding the uh, fiber optic broadband into buildings. Mm -hmm. um, as someone who's worked for landlords of buildings who've been offered this, something that usually uh, frustrates them is that in the last sort of 10, 20 years, there's been a lot of upgraded equipment and you have lots of different alternative providers <coughs> who offer the same thing, but to certain internet providers as such. So for example, you might be offering an infrastructure which will only allow a certain number of providers into that building. And when you have multiple dwelling units, your goal is to try and make that building, well, not create a monopoly, mm -hmm. so that you have to use Virgin or you have to use Sky. And one of the things that's really tricky is that every time someone wants to put that equipment in, there's old equipment that never goes out. Are you doing anything differently about removing some of the redundant equipment and uh, some of the older internet installations, the copper ones, for example? Otherwise, as a landlord, you end up with buildings that's full of redundant equipment in the same ducts, sort of <coughs> the same, same areas. Yeah, good question. I think um, it is one of the difficult challenges because historically, we really only have a, had one provider, possibly two if you may have had Virgin. So when we go into a building, for instance, what we find is uh, a whole host of mess um, that quite often nobody really knows who's, who's hanging off this infrastructure. Um, the thing is now what we're talking about is putting in fibre. We're, we're looking at saying, well, copper's going to be um, uh, discontinued, certainly by 2033, um, but no one other than the person who put it in can really take that infrastructure out. So we're beholden most of the time to open reach to say that that cabling in there is no longer used, taken out. And we have landlords that will literally say, I want this out of my building. And they'll say to us, can you just cut the cables and remove them? And we're like, well, we can't. They're not our cables. But um, if you want to do it yourself, then you're very welcome. But you might find the tenants um, start kicking up. But we are starting to find in some of the buildings, certainly the old ones, and we've had some experience in listed buildings, the landlords are now going to open which and say, can you remove this infrastructure or hide it, please, or move it? Um, and if they're insistent, if they threaten, say, well, we're going to, you know, uh, remove the infrastructure ourselves. They're usually quite good at coming in and, and, and tidying it up. We tend to go in afterwards and we, we struggle with that, that problem in that we'll go afterwards. Um, people say, well, you're pretty much a monopoly. Um, 
But until, again, it's a bit like take up, until we get the take up, what we find is the other internet service providers are pretty lazy. Unless they can see an opportunity to service tens of thousands of customers, they won't then um, come onto our network. But there are smaller ISPs that are now looking at saying, well, yes, we will. They realize the alternative network providers are, are offering infrastructure that the others aren't offering, so they can't compete, so they're quite happy. Sky, for instance, have, have publicly acknowledges that we will now start talking to alternative network providers. Um, we're, we're currently talking with people like Zen, um, who are also interested. So it may not happen now, but the beauty of fiber, full fiber infrastructure is it lasts decades. So give it five years and you'll probably find a lot of the, the, the other ISPs are also starting to, to buy the infrastructure of us. I, I would say that most landlords are probably going to need to allow probably a minimum of two, probably three infrastructure providers into the building. After that, I don't think they'll, you'll get much demand, but the first two or three will be the ones that um, that will probably, that'll give you the most competition that you, you need. It's just at the moment, with OpenReach being <coughs> one of the only provider, there's a lot of copper cabling in there, unfortunately we can't remove it. We are talking to another location where we are, we will, they've said, they only want one fibre installer to come in, and we've sort of said, well, we'll come in, but we can't guarantee the competition will be there, um, but most likely in a few years you'll find that we will have the likes of the bigger ISPs starting to resell the infrastructure. So yes, it's a, it's a pain at the moment, and I would use the benchmark of two or three. After that, you probably won't need any more, but you're going to need to allow probably two or three in with a full fibre infrastructure. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Nick Speed from BT. Um, I'm new to the sector, so I can sympathise with those people who find it quite baffling. And my question leads on from that, really, in that um, education has come out as a key theme as where we're going to make the difference and get people to understand the value of the product here. So I'm really interested to hear from David. You know, is the demand, are you meeting the demand at the moment, or you know, what could be done to accelerate that demand? And same question to the rest of the panel, really, about how do we get more people to engage with this? That's, that's a really good question, isn't it? In terms of our programme, we will touch, um, um, in terms of the whole programme, about five and a half to 6,000 businesses. <coughs> um, the bulk of those are in the small to micro, Era, as you would expect, I think partly attracted by that whole I can do this all myself element of it. Um, I think the area where we um, need to do some more work, and we are doing a lot more work, is around those medium sized companies that have either got a stack in the corner or a, a guy that's in charge of IT, historically in the past, he's an accountant that was at IT. <coughs> and it's how we get at those to, to make them think about how do we put digital as part of our strategy rather than just thinking about the technology, if I'm making sense, yeah, what, what can we do? So we're trying different ways, we do loads of, um, we, we work with other trade press and things like that, trying to get things out in the press. Are we getting as many people as we need? Probably not. Um, um, those that come through the programme, you've seen the case studies, those that take action, <coughs> loads, quite a lot go away from the workshops and might do a bit of move my business, might do a bit of Facebook advertising, but haven't really changed the way they work. So I think uh, uh, we need to be thinking about how do we go back at them and say, you've learned, but you've not changed. How can we make you change? And I'm not sure that what we're offering at the moment, which is exactly the right thing to do, it's a, you know, let's get started, but how can we support businesses through that journey? Let's go forward. Thank you, that question. Well, I think that's it for it this morning. Um, thanks so much, gentlemen, for talking to us on this topic. Another breakfast briefing where the answer to everything is education. And you're all in a university, so uh, bear that in mind. Um, just a heads up, Max Free Survey, it's out, please. Yeah, did I miss a slide, Dylan? A little, I did miss a little a slide. one, I saw it, yeah, but yeah. Do you want me to see Yeah, could you, sorry. <laughs> yeah, okay. plug really for firms to, uh, uh, where, where are I, where are I? I realised as soon as I sat down that <laughs> I uh, uh, Yeah, so I, our, D, our DMS for 2019 is currently out. So if you haven't filled it, you know, pr uh, pr please do. You know, we're dependent on the on the on the goodwill of the firms here. As I say, we had 
Uh, it was right, wasn't it? 453 last year. I mean, we're we, we trying to you know, get more and more uh, uh, every year. So if you haven't filled it, uh, 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 please do. And obviously, please look online because we're on our on our website. You know, we do you know, the DMS results and the economic impact reports are all online. So please look. And if there's any questions on that, come to me or, or Dylan uh, afterwards. We'll direct you accordingly. And it's this evidence base that provides yes, yeah. the momentum and the action to... Yeah, this is critical. Place. I mean, yeah. we can't, you know, most of the economic analysis that we're doing, uh, yeah, the construction of the, you know, the digital maturity index, it all relies on, you know, what, what comes out of this. You know, we, we, we draw inference about product, productivity improvements, you know, from what companies are saying uh, in, the, uh, in the survey. Thank you. So thank you, and um, get in contact with you, David, around um, getting involved in the in this yeah, fantastic so. initiative. So Giles, any plug for you that I can <laughs> offer at this point? <laughs> if you want full fiber broadband, <laughs> <laughs> definitely uh, need to uh, come and have a word. Okay, the plug. Oh, okay. Thanks ever so much for coming, everybody. Um, hope to see you at the next breakfast briefing. Thank you. <laughs>